Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Emergency Management and Public Safety stream at the 2020 New Zealand ESRI User Conference. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, here today, I've actually got my colleague, Ed Cook, uh, who will be co-hosting the presentation with uh, myself. Uh, my role, for those of you who don't know me, is I head up the GIS Business Development Group here at Eagle Technology. And Ed Cook um, is one of the specialists in our team who works very closely with a lot of the emergency management and public safety um, organizations in New Zealand. So today, uh, in the stream session, uh, we're going to try and make this as interactive as we possibly can. In the plenary this morning, uh, there was the ability to ask questions and some of those questions were answered. Um, but we are actually going to hold a dedicated Q&A session at the end of this stream. So if you do have your questions, uh, you'll notice on, on the virtual platform, there's the ability to ask a question. I can ask that um, if you do have questions that you, you post them through here and I'll see them on my screen down here. And at the end, we will endeavor to get some answers for you. For those of the, the, the presenters who aren't able to actually make it, and um, there's maybe one or two who may not be able to join us, and um, we will uh, get to all the questions and get your questions answered to you in due course. So today's agenda, uh, very, very quickly, um, uh, we've taken you through a welcome and a bit of an introduction. Just going to take you through a little bit of some, some of our observations and trends as to what's happened in the last year. It's been a big year. Then Ed's going to provide you with a bit of a technology update. The technology constantly moves on. And then we get into the really important stuff for me. This is uh, the real world stuff. The organizations who are, who are at the coalface delivering capability. Um, Hawke's Bay Emergency Management, uh, Fire and Emergency New Zealand, uh, we're going to get an international keynote from um, Paul Doherty, who's, gonna, who's now at the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS, and also Land Information New Zealand with some important work that they've been doing. Then, as I said, we'll, we'll finish up with the Q&A session. Okay, so in terms of current observations, last year, last 12 months, I would say, has been a really busy 12 months for um, emergency management professionals and a lot, a lot of the GIS professionals that support them. Um, we've had various um, events, I won't go into all of these uh, and specifically, but I'm sure many of you are familiar and probably actually worked on, on the responses in some cases. I guess um, the large elephant sitting in the room is, is COVID-19, which if 12 months ago you'd said uh, for, for an emergency management stream that we'd be uh, managing a pandemic for the last six or seven months, I, I would have, I would have been shocked. Um, but but as it's happened, that that's what's gone on. But as a result, um, there's been lots of uh, adaptation and actually using the technology platforms we all have to drive the response. And, and you heard an element of that this morning with the presentation from New Zealand Police for the All of Government platform. But um, one of the really key specific things for me. Uh, that's come out of this, and I've, I've seen it everywhere, is the proliferation of, of applications. And these are config the configurable apps that we all know and use. A lot of us in our in our day-to-day -day lives, things like dashboards and story maps have become very commonplace, actually. And it's fantastic to see the, the technology being leveraged for this. And there's numerous examples that, that you've heard already, and you're gonna hear more of around the activities. One of the things that's really pleased me, I think, is how the New Zealand GIS community has responded to COVID-19. And this is not just at a, a, maybe a national government level where you, you would expect it, or even a, a regional or local government level. It's actually wider. It it's encompasses larger elements of the community, including NGOs, utility companies, agribusiness organizations, that there's a wide range of organizations who have responded and are actually collaborating and sharing approaches and models and apps and data. And that for me is, is a really a huge thing and something that I think we need to recognize as a, as a community. Um, well done. And from my perspective, there, there are opportunities ahead. Um, COVID has taught us a lot of things but we have to continually evolve our approaches. We have to continually assess what we're doing, if it's the right thing, if it's the most appropriate thing to do. 
um, with geospatial now mandated or, or specified within the SIMS framework, lots of opportunities within that. And that, that was a hugely important step, which a lot of people worked very hard to make happen. That was late last year. One of the things that, that really uh, was quite startling was when I, I received a phone call from my parents who were looking at the, the John Hopkins dashboard and asked me if, if, if I knew what this thing was. And I said, that's kind of the technology that, that we all end up using. So um, the really key thing for me there is, is getting mainstream recognition in, in some of the mainstream media outlets as well, which, which builds um, understanding, which, which is really important. Um, I mentioned earlier New Zealand Police, and they're an important stakeholder, which um, I've seen fantastic steps taken by New Zealand Police to do enable their organisation. I would say um, they're, they're, they would admit they've they've taken some important first steps and they've got a way to go. But a really good signal to the community that we're building more critical mass, we're making this thing go faster, which is great. Um, lastly, I'll just touch upon the point of um, we've had to change and adapt the way we work, and um, we all had access to the virtual technology platforms, the Microsoft Teams, the Zooms, the Go-To meetings. The very nature of this conference is, is virtual. And I think the way that people have adapted to that has, has been quite incredible. Um, I, I think that's gonna be a big part of our community ongoing, actually. Um, and it, it's such a critical thing for capacity building and learning and collaboration and communication and all those good things that we need to be doing. Those platforms um, enable that which I think is, is really important for us. Anyway, um, I'm going to pass over now to Ed Cook, who's going to give you a bit of a, uh, an update on the technology. Cool, thank you, Frank. I'll tell you everybody, it's, it's wonderful to be able to still present to you, even in um, these trying times. A lot of you um, come from the GIS side of the fence, but I'm recognising also we've got quite a lot of people who come from the domain of emergency management and, and lifeline operators and first responders. And really, um, technology has been the enabler that has allowed a lot of things to happen um, that previously couldn't have been done easily. And really, in this technology update, I want you to be thinking about where this, these new releases in technology can be applied inside your organisations. So before we get to the tools, I just want to touch on um, the key thing of data and information. Really, a lot, a lot of these tools are powerful because of the information that they're consuming and having ready to use content on hand to immediately use. It's one of those key things that has allowed emergency management to really proceed in the last few years from being um, you know, intelligence gaps and information vacuums to something that's an informed operation from a location perspective. And there are some great initiatives happening around the country right now, both inside Eagle and from a lot of our stakeholders and a lot of our customers um, to really use the content um, inside their organizations and serve it up in a way others could be using. And one of the examples that you'll hear more about later is um, Base Data NZ. This is enabling some of those key data sets that a lot of us download and then have to upload ourselves in order to use to instead be offered up as services. That it's just one click away to start using in our maps and apps and other products. We can think about the data, but it's only as good as perhaps the, the base map underneath it. And base maps are almost that unsung hero, if you like, of um, geospatial um, information technology and there's a lot of work that's been done behind the scenes to allow you to have the most up-to-date imagery as possible and um, procured openly by a lot of our local government stakeholders all in one map and so really what we've been trying to do here at Eagle is making sure that any imagery that's captured as soon as it's available adding it into our raster base maps. You'll see that vector base maps in the last 12 months have suddenly exploded on the scene and these are creating really compelling um, experiences for people as they're using um, geospatial technology. Having a really fast, responsive, modern looking map um, is really making um, people's data and information pop more than it has so in the past. So I invite you to try out um, those vector base maps. They're a combination of um, commonly available data sets and others that aren't as well known. So definitely worth checking out if you need a good reference product underneath. And finally, OpenStreetMap, um, as mentioned in the plenary, but a lot of the information inside OpenStreetMap can um, supplement perhaps gaps where um, initial coverage isn't available. And so being able to use the OpenStreetMap players almost as that, um, that foundation, if you like, to then have um, other information on top is something to consider um, with a lot of your information needs. 
So I just wanted to touch on that in terms of what's available uh, right now. But of course, um, this is the fun bit of the conference where we get to talk about what's the latest and greatest. And in the content realm, there's a lot coming um, that you should be excited about. For those users of the NZTM um, imagery base map, we're going to be adding bathymetry. So you suddenly um, don't just have your, your base map stop uh, where the land does. Actually, it's going to continue out um, beyond our shores. There's going to be improved data on cartography to the vector base map, so keep an eye out for that, especially a lot of those small towns um, across New Zealand who may be using these maps. Um, you're going to be seeing a lot of coverage coming in there, um, so you should be excited about that, definitely. And for those who do still lean on our raster base maps, there will be a tiling scheme adjustment, meaning that you'll get the latest and greatest inside your applications too. Some key highlights uh, for the next 12 months, we we're looking back at the last 12 months of events, and you know, it's a, it's a long way um, since the last conference at Fields. And in between this conference and next year's conference, we're looking to have an Aotearoa elevation service. This is particularly exciting due to the work that Linz has been doing um, around the content space and um, procuring a lot of LiDAR imagery. So suddenly having that really high resolution three dimensional map um, is possible. And we're looking to see what we can do to make it easier for you to use that data inside the ArcGIS platform. So keep an eye out for that in base data NZ with more data sets being added, um, including LCDB version five. If you do have any improvements though, this is your, your data as much as it's ours, you'll see there's an email address down the bottom right. So livingatlas at eagle.co.nz um, is very responsive to your requests. We've had to make a few tinkers and there's been a few um, teething things when we first rolled out these vector base maps and they are able to be addressed quickly because of you. So we'd like um, that dialogue to keep happening because um, it keeps us on our toes and allows you to have the best base maps out there. So now into the application tier, which um, for many of those who know me, um, I get particularly excited about. And the application tier of the Esri platform is expanding, but also existing applications are being enhanced with new capabilities. So as I said previously, this is creating opportunities for new workflows that haven't been possible out of the box before. So I want to touch first on mobility. Um, ArcGIS Mission is one of these tools that really for field apps, it's going light here years ahead in terms of what we thought was possible. Being able to do instant messaging and um, offline peer-to-peer -peer communication between devices, it's just something that is unbelievable um, to be able to, to say that we can do inside the platform. So this is allowing tactical situational awareness and communication. Um, another tool which is still being enhanced um, is workforce for ArcGIS and the ability to go offline with this app with the taskings you've received from your dispatcher is something that hasn't been possible until recently. So having that offline capability is fantastic. And both of these applications, key points, uh, they're going beyond just capturing data with the apps. It's actually managing your entire operation from a location perspective. A collection of um, quality information to be turned into intelligence is still key. And the wealth of applications available um, in the platform right now are, are quite incredible. Um, ArcGIS site scan, as you saw in the plenary, you know, that, that's, a, that's a capability that's been acquired recently by Esri and is now part of our platform. And we're proud to say we finally do an end-to-end -end, um, flight planning, capture and processing of drone imagery that can then be disseminated in applications. So something to definitely keep an eye out for. Um, ArcGIS Quick Capture has almost joined this, this movement forward with drones. You can now use um, in the latest beta of ArcGIS Quick Capture um, the location position of your drone in the sky. So you can set up a drone to be watching um, over an area and capture your points of interest based on its location rather than that of your mobile device. So we'll sure to see uh, many users, including I'm sure a few of our presenters, uh, get on, on that technology over the next few um, months. ArcGIS field maps, you know, this is that destination um, where we'll have a single application for field activities, hopefully in the next 12 to 18 months as more applications capabilities get brought inside it. And Survey123, the old favourite, there's more question types and support for the NZTM base maps inside that, as Sam mentioned um, in the plenary. So once we've got all our raw information, how can we turn it into quality intelligence? And that's when the analysis piece comes in. And we're proud to say that the ArcGIS platform deals with vector and raster um, information as well as each other. Um, ArcGIS Excalibur is an application allowing web-based exploitation of imagery. So that's also a bleak imagery too. So for those who are consuming and looking to do 
um, outputs with large volumes of imagery in the cloud, that's one to, to definitely look at. Um, ArcGIS Image An Analyst is allowing the same sort of capability, but also um, machine learning and artificial intelligence capabilities. Um, feature extraction is one of those things where everyone dreams of being able to put in um, a, an array of pixels and it spits out exactly what we want. And that's what ArcGIS Image Analyst is allowing to do, a whole, along with a whole um, wealth of other functionality. Um, for desktop-based intelligence analysts, ArcGIS Pro for Intel has been one of those tools which quietly in the background has been adding more and more to it. And as you can see by the image um, on the bottom, um, it can do things that you didn't think were possible um, from a GIS perspective, having things like link charts and timelines of data that's showing on your map, you know, quite an incredible tool um, to leverage if you have that sort of information to derive insights from. Finally though, how do we show this, um, all this information that's been captured and analysed? The dissemination piece has been quite integral, especially during COVID, and having the next generation of web applications to show this information, um, ArcGIS Experience Builder is a fantastic app to be using for a lot of your workflows that you may have used Web App Builder for in the past. ArcGIS dashboards, even though you know there aren't too many new graphs and charts that have been added to it, there's a specific leap forward in terms of Arcade being enabled inside that application. This is allowing you to display numbers and statistics and pieces of information that have been coded in between data being captured and stored somewhere and showing on your dashboard. So you can do quite sophisticated um, KPIs, if you like, with that. So something for analysts to be aware of um, is that arcade capability in particular. And finally, for those who love a good presentation and briefing, ArcGIS Story Maps continues to add um, new capability and functionality in it. Um, particularly for briefings, you can do things like timelines inside it. Um, just a really nice interactive experience to communicate and tell a story about the information that you're um, trying to portray to your decision makers. So really quite a lot available there. It's quite daunting looking at all the different applications out there. You know, we've got such a wide platform. Um, how do you get started? One of the things I, I like to draw people's attention to are the solutions out there. Um, and the solutions enable you to click a button and have everything deployed for you that all talks and fits together. And two um, solutions in particular um, to be aware of are the COVID-19 response and recovery templates um, released and also the special events permitting and operations, which enables you to manage quite small scale events, um, but have everything already set up. Um, a good experience in deploying templates has come from New Plymouth District Council and their support um, for COVID-19. And I almost want to put them in their own category of solutions, because these are really local adaptations of international templates um, that have then been used and leveraged by others around the country. So when we talk about solutions, sure, we have some from Esri Direct, but look across the fence, look across the boundary of what your neighbours are doing, because in a way they're creating solutions and workflows that uh, if you can pick up and, and start with, actually you can get a lot further down the line than having to start from scratch and blue sky thinking. So just think about what your community are doing around you um, in the geospatial world and actually what you can learn from them. So that's uh, a little bit about the technology, but I now want to pass across to people across the sector who are using these tools to do quite incredible things, and particularly in response and recovery. Um, to start off, I want to introduce Teresa Simcox from Hawke's Bay Emergency Management. Um, Teresa's presentation is titled Emergency Mapping, Engaging and Empowering Across Sector Boundaries. And this is quite an incredible story, which actually I think sums up T's approach to technology, which is really, it's a journey that um, requires people at the center of it. And T's experience includes um, first responder and emergency management experience. So really bringing all that in um, and bringing people along the way to, to reach new heights in the Hawke's Bay region. Um, this is something that I'm sure you'll enjoy, but I'll stop and, and pass it over to T to tell us more about it. So over to you, Teresa. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Teresa Simcox and I work for Hawke's Bay Civil Defence Emergency Management and I'm presenting today on emergency mapping, engaging and empowering across sector boundaries. So what do we mean when we talk about engaging and empowering? 
It's my belief that partnerships through technology are all about making it as easy as possible for our response partners to be at the same table with us, whether virtually or physically, so that we can share information and find common understandings in emergencies. As part of my everyday role, I look at our systems and the interrelation of those systems. I spend a lot of time looking at how information flows through and how they each pass the data from one place to the next, and thinking about how we build and future-proof them for ongoing operations. Part of the problem of being a technology advisor is that we often have all of the love in the world for what we're doing, but very little budget, and in my particular case, a very minimal skill. So in order to be able to build capability, uh, we often have to leverage off the skills and goodwill of other professionals, particularly where it is a very specific need, such as GIS. So how do we roll out a GIS capability in Hawke's Bay with no money and no skill? So I took a two-phase approach to how we would do this in Hawke's Bay. And the first part of my approach was build it and they will come. How do I get an army of nerdlets? I give them something to commit to. So I took three prongs in this. And the first was to engage across the various agencies, enthuse them, get them really invested and interested in what we're doing and where we want to go. And thirdly, to exercise them. So give them something to work towards and then to perform in, in order to cement what they've learnt. So we did this through a series of workshops and trainings. And the first part of my master plan was to be organisationally agnostic. So anybody is welcome. Non-ESRI organisations were asked to be part of it. And this was a really important aspect of our approach. It didn't need to be defined by the system but it was really important that we did commit to at least one system so that we could get something up and running. So once we'd engaged and got some investment from them, we started to run some workshops. And through those workshops, it was identified that we needed a platform for people to be able to engage on. So we used Microsoft Teams inside of the civil defense tenancy so that we would be able to invite everybody in as guests so that they could collaborate together. And the first thing we did was created a work plan. So the questions that we were asking were things like, what do we currently have? What do we think we might need in order to be able to respond? And who is going to be able to do it? Who can commit the time? Part of this was also thinking about what does a geospatial team look like? What types of roles do we need? How many people do we need on a shift? What types of skills are they going to require? So that was a big aspect of those first couple of workshops, thinking about what do we need for response? Once we had engaged them, the next thing was to enthuse. What were the partner projects that we could work on that would get them really invested and interested. And the first thing we uh, started on was the FENS sectors project with Fire and Emergency New Zealand. And the summary of this project is that we took all of Hawke's Bay and a little bit to the north and south to align with FENS's boundaries and broke them down into sectors that would be drivable by a fire appliance or a police unit or an ambulance after a response to do rapid reconnaissance. Part of this was pre-identifying safe forward points inside of the sectors. So in normal operations where civil defence isn't involved, these safe forward points could be communicated across the agencies for normal work. Uh, the other thing that we discovered as part of this is that in, you really need to field test your sectors. It takes a lot of time. You need to be certain that they are the right size, that they have the right boundaries, that type of thing. So it was a really good project to build those relationships across the agencies. The next thing we invested in was bringing the civil defence staff to the table. Getting GIS people excited about maps is easy. Getting civil defence to buy into it is a little bit harder. So part of the strategy was to get them using some of the geospatial products outside of response. We ran a one hour workshop on how to build story maps with our community resilience team. And the product you see in front of you is the first prototype which was built by a community resilience advisor with the community he was working with in order to be able to publicize a resilience plan. 
Lastly, we went into the exercise part of phase one, which was putting our staff through their paces during a four day long exercise. It was based around a large scale earthquake in Tutera. And this went across six different coordination centers and was multi-agency. And for this particular exercise, we flew in a GIS specialist from Wellington and they essentially guided our staff through building something from scratch right through. And over the period of 48 hours, we managed to bring in information from Fire and Emergency New Zealand, who used the exercise as an opportunity to, to field test some of their quick capture apps and dashboards, and then bring that information into the Emergency Coordination Centre's dashboard, which was built on the fly over the 48 hours period. And as you can see, it also tested some of the sectors that we'd made, how we could use them to display the information that was collected in a way that was easy to interpret. So on the right hand side there, some of that colour coordinating you can see in those polygons is in relation to roading access. So phase one was really about getting people on board and getting them excited. Phase two was more about how to push it further. So we have a capability, how do we then build that capability further? So we approached our coordinating executives group in partnership with Fire and Emergency New Zealand with a proposal about establishing a rapid response team. For those who are non-civil defence uh, staff, the coordinating executives group is the CEOs and the heads of agencies such as police, fire, DHB, and they all come together and basically set the work program and priorities for civil defence. And what we asked this group was for formal support and commitment for us to use staff to establish a GIS rapid response team. And having secured that agreement from them, we were able to produce a set of protocols with minimum training standards and equipment requirements and deployment criteria. Now that we had a rapid response team capability identified, the next thing to do was to really train them for the task. So this is the types of skills that they would need geospatially to be able to work in emergency response. And this was a bit of a balance between what we needed them to be able to do and also giving them skills which would be useful and applicable in their day-to-day -day roles as GIS analysts in the councils and the various agencies. Um, part of this was getting them to go out and do some field collection of data, so practicing using apps out on the ground like the staff in the field would be doing, and then bringing it back to the centre to be processed and displayed. And one of the neat things was forcing them into a surprise briefing. This was a really, really important aspect of the training because it really cemented using skills that would be needed inside an emergency coordination centre. It's one thing to produce great geospatial products and one thing to be able to produce and show the information you want to, but actually the real value is when a staff member can explain what they're trying to show, that they can brief to it and that they are able to articulate what the decision makers are seeing on those dashboards and in those products. So how did we know whether we were successful in our initial GIS foray? It's very well to train and exercise, but the proof is really in the response pudding. Unfortunately for us, that was tested very quickly. So we did our training in December and in January, February, we had the Tongoyo fire just north of uh, Hastings district in Hawke's Bay. And we also then after that went straight into COVID. So success for us was being able to operate really, really virtually in what was essentially a bit of a directionless vacuum. So our staff were having to use their team site to be able to coordinate during response and task each other. They also, to a certain extent, had to build their own rosters amongst themselves. One of the other really neat things was that they went into using products like Experience Builder, which were things that we hadn't taught in training and were quite new to them. We also didn't have staff properly committed to the response until about the 24th of March. And one of the great joys of the rapid response team was seeing that the first people who were able to step up weren't necessarily the council staff, it was our partner agencies like Fire and Emergency and Port of Napier. 
once they had got into the building, it took about two to three days for us to really start getting some good geospatial intelligence. The product here is a essential services map, which was built in experience builder by some of our Hastings staff. And it was really about looking at key facilities of interest and the intent was that this would become public facing at some point. And this really showed that although we'd trained in some aspects, they were able to pick up things on the fly that hadn't been used before and use them in a really good creative way. The other thing which was really neat was seeing some of our Napier staff um, pick up and roll out FME licensing for us on the fly so that we could take data from DHB, process it, anonymize it, and then display it inside of our own system. And what that looked like is on the bottom left of your screen is being able to report case numbers against sectors. So it's linking in with the FENS initiative that we'd done, the sectorization, and it's also plugging the DHB's information together with that. The other really neat thing we saw was that some of our staff, like Hawke's Bay Regional Council, were doing things like co-authoring documents inside of the team site, writing SOPs that could be picked up and used by other staff. And up in the top left corner, we also had non-geospatial users from our intelligence team taking data, processing it through Power BI and analytics, and then geospatially displaying that using the ESRI plugins. There was lots of really good work happening, which was not necessarily stuff that we had trained on. Throughout this response, we did also have a concurrent response running to the drought, which was affecting Hawke's Bay. So our, civil, our Hawke's Bay Regional Council team were also running independently a drought response team with Hawke's Bay Rural Support Trust. And this was running a separate dashboard, which was just then fed into our storyboard. And this was looking at recording farm assessments ratings over a period of four months, looking at things like pasture quality and welfare assessments and referrals that needed to be done. And the staff who built this were directly applying the skills that had been learnt in the Eagle pilot course in December. Lastly, we also had um, one of our staff members create a product which I think really encompassed all of the things that we were trying to achieve with our initial geospatial capability. And that was creating a product that could be shared and consumed by partner agencies to inform their tactical planning. So it wasn't of the highest importance to civil defense. It was more important to those agencies that would be doing on ground operations and that could be really informed in that planning by a product that had been produced. So it was really, really re good return on investment there. So over the period of the COVID response, uh, we had a team of 14 and they produced 49 different products in the Civil Defence A goal, which was absolute mammoth effort. So that was a real outcome that justified our time and money investment in this project. What do we learn from all of this? So our experience has only really just started and we have so much more to do in this space. But we know that if we invest in people, we are justly rewarded by what we get back. The training is super important. It gives people the skills, the knowledge and the capability to be able to step up. But also it needs to be exercised and used in order to retain it. And lastly, never underestimate the value of the connections and the networks that you build by engaging widely. You'll be surprised who turns up on the day and it won't be the ones that you expect. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, for that. That was a, an excellent example of how to build a capability, not only across your own organization, but actually reaching out to other partner agencies and uh, sister organizations as well. Really, really excellent example there. Thank you so much, Teresa, for sharing that with us. I'm sure it'll, it'll stimulate lots of thinking within with the attendees here. Okay, moving on to our next presenter, I'd like to introduce Air Commander Jeff Monder. Uh, Jeff has extensive experience in the emergency services area with 25 years of operational experience doing a multitude of things uh, for fire and emergency as well as, well as some of his previous roles. Um, Jeff also, as well, as well as wearing his fire and emergency hat, also um, 
works closely with the United Nations Interag organization and has been responsible for a lot of uh, capability building in that space as well, which is actually of, of global significance. So at this point, I'll pass over to Jeff and let you, him tell you all about it. Jeff, over to you. Hi, my name is Jeff Monda. I'm an area commander with Fire and Emergency New Zealand. I have a couple of roles, and one of them include managing our USAR information management systems, and I also manage the UAS program and associated information intelligence products. Fire and Emergency New Zealand has a broad mandate across uh, emergency management, um, and, and so as part of that, there are there are requirements and needs for effective and uh, smart operational intelligence systems for across a, a wide range of different event types to provide situational awareness and enhance decision making. There are a number of major events across New Zealand that people may or may not remember, Christchurch being one of them. Um, significant lack of cohesive information management uh, within the Christchurch event led to a lot of uh, repetition and, and and difficulty in making decisions that were effective and informed. Kaikoura again, um, a lot of challenges within Kaikoura that resulted in systems having to be built in the field. But as a result of Kaikoura, a number of really quite good outcomes were achieved. One of them being a national damage assessment model, which was developed by McDem um, after we provided an AFAC based national damage assessment model and as from a fire emergency USAR perspective we developed and built an information and coordination management system that is now embedded across all of the USAR teams um, in the UN space. Edgecombe is where we introduced the use of UAV into, into our operations uh, which provide an enhanced understanding and situational awareness uh, and when combined with ground-based and uh, local authority-based information provides a very good common operating picture, which was very effective in informing the, the local communities um, around the damage to their dwellings and, and timeframes that might uh, take to, to get information and get back into their houses. Um, TC Gita and Tonga was a USAR or DART response um, to support the Tongan government as a result of the damage caused by the Cat 4 and Cat 5 um, tropical cyclone that came ashore. Um, key, key findings from, from Tonga were the integration of use with uh, local, local uh, firefighters and local responders, as well as the development of an information management system that was again developed on the fly, utilizing Survey 123 and uh, um, an operations dashboard to provide uh, information to not only our own government, but also for Tonga and in this case, the Australians as well. Fire Emerges New Zealand has uh, operates in, in quite a few different areas, but three major areas that we focus on where the technology that we're talking about is, is currently applicable. Um, and that's in our domestic environment, our NZN core Pacific space and in the Insurag environment, which is the International Search and Rescue Advisory Group from the UN that manages all the classified um, USAR teams or urban search and rescue teams um, that deploy um, as part of the INSERAG methodology. What we have uh, found is that over time we, we have ended up um, using, utilizing more and more ESRI products um, to be able to deliver on, on our outcomes and deliver on the expectations of, of our partners around information management intelligence systems. Um, and this goes from everything from, from Survey 123 through to the, the workforce and, and quick capture, our new site scan and mission opportunities, as well as uh, storyboarding and, and experience. All, all products that provide us with a range of platforms to be able to deliver information to the, in the right format uh, to the right people uh, quite quickly. And that, that's a key factor that we'll uh, come up with. This, this particular slide here is showing um, the INSERAG Information and Coordination Management System, which is effectively a field-based data collection pro process that is then uh, enhanced and, and managed through dashboards um, and, and storyboard to present um, specific functions with information that 
is tailored to their needs to be able to make decisions or, or understand what's going on. This particular case is showing a summary um, board of, of, of a range of uh, work sites and, and actions and taskings that have been taken against a specific event. Um, and this, this particular program, ICMS, is now embedded uh, within all of the USAR teams, all 58 of them across the world. And in fact, it had its first real life deployment as part of, of the European USAR and civil protection uh, function that was deployed into Be Beirut after the port explosion early in August. Uh, this particular example here shows us how, once again, we've managed to have to tool up a bespoke model in the field for TC Gita. Now, the project here was we were required to identify um, a range of damaged buildings and damaged building types um, with a view to being, uh, allowing the, the Tongan government to be able to identify how many of their shelters, schools, churches, um, etc. were still functional and able to be used in case there was another cyclone to come in as well as providing the education department and the Department of Interior with um, an understanding of the damage and work required going forward. Key challenges are often how we present the information once it's been collected. Um, and storyboard and experience provide us with uh, methodologies and um, systems to be able to present a range of information and a different a range of different methodologies to be able to make sure that we target the right people with the right information and in the right format as quickly as possible um, and, and definitely providing context in the view in this particular case we were using photographs mapping and also uh, short videos from uav one of the comments that came back from the Tongan Education Ministry was that they weren't going to have to spend two weeks in the field identifying the damage because the systems had provided them with enough of a situational awareness to be able to do that. Uh, this particular image here is a helicopter driven quick capture um, product which was um, completed in, in the West Coast um, by West Coast CDM and, and during the flooding events. And it's just a matter of showing a whole lot of points uh, which can then be displayed um, on a dashboard or a storyboard with relative uh, geo uh, geocoding to ensure that people are understanding where they look where they are and what they're looking at which again gives a very strong um, a, a situational awareness often for people that are not actually in the field or available to get to the field but are making decisions based on this information of course, being a fire emergency in recent times, we've had a significant number of wildfires, and this is a this is a workforce tasking and containment line hotspot um, system that was developed uh, for the use of UAV and thermal imaging to be able to identify hotspots around a containment line. Um, this also provided um, some some direct information around the percentage of containment based on a, a calculation, but in this case. Each of the hotspots identified and UAS missions or, or completed or able to be uh, displayed. Um, and the information from, from the, the UAV flights were then um, produced into a product that was then delivered to the ground crews either on a map or on a, on a device um, using Explorer or something like PDF Maps where the hotspots are identified in the GPS location of the individuals able to walk up to those hotspots and um, deal with them accordingly. Now in recent times, the use of UAV has become reasonably prolific. We have a, a reasonably um, successful drone UAV program, um, which is based within our USAR team. We have a range of different levels of UAV. Um, and uh, the key thing around uh, use of UAV is it's not, not, it hasn't really got much to do with the UAV. It's got to do what it produces. So if we're depending on the product that we're looking to have deployed or, de or produced, uh, often will depend on the sensor, which is, again then depends on the type of UAV required to carry it. In this case, we're looking at 3D imagery of a fire damage building, um, provides a very good situational awareness for fire investigator and also potentially in court. Uh, you know, this same type of uh, technology has been used on the White Island or Fakari event. And 
and the ability to produce this type of high quality intelligence product that gives very, very good situational awareness of understanding for people that do not have any that is, is very, very valuable. One of the key things for us in deploying our technology is that developing a single source of software for integrated operational intelligence solutions um, just across all of government fens in the Pacific is very, very important as it allows um, agencies that have, have already used ESRI products, for example, to be able to integrate very, very easily. We use a whole range of products, both um, in, in coordination centres and USAR tents and remotely when they're deployed across the world. Um, it is a truly international capability um, and it's not only just for big events and big emergencies, it's often, you know, can be used for day-to-day -day operations, um, which is a real benefit because using this stuff in your day-to-day -day operations means that when it becomes a major event, it's not, it's not new. It allows authorities to share authoritative data sources so that information that you're getting is from an authoritative source, which adds to the credibility. Um, one of the things we do, and it's really important, is to make the field work as simple and as, as easy as possible for staff that are in the field. I will use a range of products, including Explorer and Survey123. One of the key things is, is to ensure that data that's been used or created is able to be used again. We, we do this using one, two, Survey123 as, as an initial gathering tool and then using um, some links and map-based methodology out of uh, Explorer for ArcGIS to be able to link to other forms which then pre-populate. Reduces the errors, reduces the time, and engages uh, field staff. Um, ICMS deployment into Beirut was, was, a, was a success. It's a significant event, um, and we were able to support that, support the 12 teams that are deployed um, from New Zealand, the US, and Germany very, very successfully. Um, so it was, it was a great success and a really good example of a truly international uh, capability of, of this type of product and software and understanding that the operational skills and understanding required to, to, to make it effective is a great combination. It's always about our people. It, it, it truly is the, the, the people that we have that enable us to build these things and to work these things are always going to be um, the key to, to success and engaging them in the process of development is also a key function. Um, so our interag environment operates across three zones. Um, and, and as I say, ICMS is deployed into this field. Uh, we operate in the Asia Pacific, Asia Pacific, which is here. Um, and in this case, it was the Asia, it was Africa, Europe, and Middle East that deployed into Beirut, but again, supported by both uh, Europe and, and Asia Pacific. Um, our, our NZ Inc. Um, responsibilities and support for MFAT and New Zealand government operations. In, in many cases, in some cases, even outside of that, we supported uh, Hurricane Dorian with U USAR teams from USA um, using our DART software that we developed to be able to collect data in the Carib Caribbean. And in, in our home state, there's a lot of work to be done around developing or a lot of opportunity to develop uh, all of government inter interactive um, and collaborative common operating pictures for a whole range of sudden onset disasters from wildfire adverse weather, you know, famine, pestilence, etc. Uh, key findings for us that worked is, you know, it's it's foreign emergency. We're lucky in some ways we have a clear main, cl clear mandate um, that, that um, is non-prescriptive and it does take into account the requirements and to work with other agencies. Um, I guess for us the desire to have a common operating picture um, based on this is something that's, that's high on our agenda. Uh, as the value is quite you know, significant. Key findings for us is that resourcing of capability and key staff is a, is, is a key factor. Um, you know, people with a vision are required to make this happen and it's a you know, broad operating mandate. Um, you, you need to ensure that you have the, you, the, the capabilities within your organisation to be able to affect, to be manage um, this type of capability. It's not just GIS, it's operational intelligence. Organisational factor, um, foreign emergency does support the principles of capacity building and within the UN General Assembly resolution around INSERAG. Um, and you know, we're looking to have a strategic alignment with this type of information and high level strategies, the ability to, to develop five to 20 year plans around um, what our operational intelligence systems will look and who we're going to work with. Um, what does um, senior management support is vital? Does the organisation have the capability to do it? Is it a focus? Do we have the right people? 
and has it sustained enough capacity to sustain the capability. And I think closing thoughts for us is it's an ongoing um, program. It's all about the technology enabled solutions which people enable. Um, we need to focus on the end state and ensure that we understand what we want to work for. You must have capacity to be able to develop it and everyone can be a winner. It just takes an understanding of everyone's needs. Thank you very much for that, Jeff. It's always amazing to see how just a, a local um, capability that's been developed um, in New Zealand has global reach. Um, looking on the news at Beirut, I had no idea actually underpinning it was, was ESRI technology and workflows to, to actually help and record um, what was happening down there on the ground. Um, it's amazing to see the journey that FENS have taken um, in the Urban Search and Rescue Program, you know, hearing about how the drone capability came about. And I know that most of the major events um, that happen in New Zealand, uh, FENS are, are right in there, um, helping to supply that information. And as Jeff said, getting the right info to the right people in the right format. And um, Jeff definitely um, takes it to the next level in terms of format um, with dashboards and 3D mapping and, and everything that comes with it. So I'd like now to hand it over to um, Susan Shaw. Um, Susan Shaw is going to present on um, informing what's next. Is your data ready for the next emergency? And before we go into Susan's presentation, I just want to remind you, um, we've got a few questions already streaming in. Um, for this session. So if you have any you would like to ask any of our presenters, um, please enter them and we'll make every effort we can to either um, answer them in the Q&A to follow these presentations, or we'll send um, in two weeks time answers to these questions. So they'll be answered regardless. But anyway, um, enough of that. I'd like to hand it over to Susan, who's going to talk about the, the data that underpins a lot of um, the technology and tools that we use. And the great leaps forward the New Zealand government, um, by Lynn's lead, have, have been able to create these data sets in a way that others can use them immediately um, within emergencies. Quite an impressive um, bit of work the resilience team at Lynn's are doing. So enough from me. Time to hand over to Susan. Over to you, Susan. Tana koutou katoa. My name is Susan Shaw and I'm the Senior Resilience Advisor at Land Information New Zealand. And it's a real pleasure to be here today to share with you some top tips about how you might get your data ready for the next emergency and help both inspire and inform what's next. And in order to do that, I'm going to take you through the four R's of emergency management. That's risk reduction, readiness, response and recovery, and offer some data suggestions that may be of help under each of these circumstances. So the first R is risk reduction. And risk reduction is all about identifying and analyzing long-term risk so that we can either remove or reduce that risk. And the most important thing when we're looking at risk is to ensure we've got some good quality data so that we can have a really good benchmark to know whether we're having an impact on that day, on that risk. And consistent data is really important there. So I've got two suggestions for you about how you may, might make your data more consistent. So the first is in terms of height data. And the easiest way to do that is to, to adopt the New Zealand Vertical Datum 2016. So you remember 10, 15 years ago, we all moved from New Zealand Map Grid to New Zealand Transfers Makeda. That's for our XY points, and this is exactly the same, but for our height or our Z value. Um, if you wanted to head over to the LINS website, there's lots of information that would help you uh, as you adopt the new vertical datum for heights. And just last week, LINS published this web map to show whether you and your neighbours in the territorial authorities and regional councils have adopted the vertical datum yet. So I'd encourage you to work together to try and get national coverage for our height data. It's, it's going to be huge if we, if we want to manage the impacts of climate change in the long term or the immediate effects of ground movement after an earthquake, then having a shared um, way of measuring our heights is going to be really important so that we can be consistent. The second uh, suggestion for consistency is that you might want to have a look at the LINS imagery base map. And this is just a really good opportunity to do a shout out to our friends and colleagues in Auckland. Um, hope that you're doing well. Hope that by the time you're watching this, that you're out of level three. 
and I look forward to us all being back together again at Sky City at some point in the not too distant future. So that's risk reduction. The second R is readiness. And readiness is all about putting plans in place so that you're ready to respond to an event. And during the readiness and your planning, then knowing that you're using the source of truth and you're incorporating the source of truth into your business as usual processes is a really good opportunity. And again, I've got two suggestions for you here. So just last week, Lynn's added the Needham to the New Zealand Building Outlines data set. And this means that this national data set now covers over 95% of the populated area, with just areas such as Fiordland and the Chatham Islands still being a work in progress. And what comes with this national data set is a national, unique and persistent ID for those buildings. And if there's only one takeaway you get from this whole presentation, I'm hoping this is, this is it, because I think this is where you could add the most value. So if you could look for opportunities to adopt this building ID in your business as usual processes. So if you're a council, you might adopt it in your building consent process. If you're a national agency that manage properties across the country, such as Ministry of Education manages schools, you could adopt the building ID in your asset management uh, program. Once you're using it in your BAU, then it's really easy to transfer that in an emergency response. So what we have here is the MB flooding rapid assessment form. So we could put that ID there. You imagine if we then chain that up to lots of information that gets captured during a response, how we could pull that information together and really save time. Whether it's about the placard that measures whether the building's accessible, whether it's the geotech report on the property the building sits on, um, whether it's the EQC claim, whether it's photographs of the building, lots of information could all be pulled together by using that unique ID for the building. So I'd really encourage you to take a look at that and see if you could adopt that in your business as usual processes. The other data set that you might want to consider too, if um, rail is important to you, is to take a look at the Kiwi Rail data. The Kiwi Rail have done a lot of work over the last two years to improve their data. It's available under uh, multiple formats. Um, it includes both the Kiwi Rail tracks and also private tracks. Uh, and it's a really good source for, for rail information. It's available from the Kiwi Rail open data portal. And there's a lot of the rail infrastructure that goes with that, so tunnels and bridges and so on. So have a think about maybe replacing the data that you've got with this Kiwi Rail data as the source of truth. So our third R is, uh, of course, response. And um, while good quality data is really important response, what comes to the fore is the speed in which you can access that information. So sometimes a paper map is still appropriate, such as this brief injury in Pigeon Valley Fire. Um, but more and more, it's about apps and dashboards, and that's the way people want to see the data. Um, and so I just want to share with you three apps that might be useful during a response. So the first is um, that you're probably aware of is from the New Zealand Transport Agency, which gives you information about the state of state highways. So is that state highway closed? Is it congested? Are there roadblocks? And that's really good information to pull into your response processes. <clears throat> the second one on a similar vein is from NIWA. And NIWA have done a lot of work on their river environment classification data to make it more usable. So you can find a web map, again, from the NIWA open data portal. And what they've done is um, they've taken the highest order streams at a national level. And as you zoom in, then more rivers turn on. It just makes that really data detailed data set much easier to comprehend. So this image here at a regional level, we just go down to the third tier of um, the river network. Um, keep an eye on NIWA's um, open data portal too, because they're planning to do a similar thing with catchments. So at a national scale, you just see in the larger catchments. And uh, it's great to be uh, seeing their progress with that. And the third app that you may be aware of is the population dashboard. So uh, we're all really pleased when stats were able to um, launch the uh, census information, but a lot of information came out of that. There was a lot of layers and those layers had heaps of different attributes that we had to try and get our head around. 
and the dashboard that Statistics New Zealand have produced um, gives a really nice simple view that's dictated by the map extent. Um, the usual parameters there of age and gender and religion and so on, but I'd really draw your attention to two parameters. The first is the labour force status, which says whether people are at work or not, which is can be used as an indicator about whether somebody is likely to be in during the day or only at night, whether they're commuting to work. And also the fact that Stats New Zealand incorporated the deprivation index. I know that that information has been used by a lot of agencies on the COVID-19 response to make sure that our most vulnerable communities are getting the support they need. So check out the population dashboard from Stats. And if you can't find it, try tinyurl.com slash population dashboard. So the fourth R is of course recovery. And um, the support agencies might be moving out of their emergency operations center or equivalent, going back to their own organizations. And so it's really important that organizations continue to share the same information and data sharing becomes really important. So two last things to wrap up with about how you might share data to ensure you've got the consistency again. So the first is that to make you aware that LINS published nine of its key data sets as ESRI REST services in March. Now, obviously, if we we're in San Diego and Jack was announcing that right now, there would be a standing ovation, I'm sure. But we would just be happy if you would give LINS feedback on whether you find these services useful. So the uses statistics are high, so we're taking that as a good sign. But we'd really love to hear from you about whether this information is useful. And then last, but by very no means least, we would like to congratulate Fire and Emergency New Zealand for publishing the NZ localities and suburbs data. So the silver lining from COVID-19 was that we're able to use that situation to paint a really strong picture about why it was just so important to um, make this data available. So, uh, it was important to model COVID based on suburbs to maintain confidentiality of cases. It was important um, that the correct address including the suburb was used for accurate contact tracing of individuals. And also it was important that the suburbs were added to navigational aids so that the delivery drivers who were delivering essential services had the best information available to make that happen. And so Fantastic, Fire and Emergency launched um, New Zealand localities. It's available in multiple formats and a Creative Commons license, so it's open to all. So that was a whistle-stop tour across the four R's of emergency management. And, and effectively what I've done there is introduce you to the key data sets for resilience and climate change work that LINS is collaborating on with five other lead agencies. The New Zealand Transport Agency, Fire and Emergency New Zealand, NIWA, Kiwi Rail, and Stats New Zealand. So if you'd like to find out more, head on over to the LINS website or get in touch via my email. And we'd look forward to hearing from you on how we could make these key data sets better. Kia ora, thank you for your time. Thank you, Susan, for that. That was a fantastic presentation. Much appreciated. I, I think uh, highlighting an incredibly important program of work for the country, actually. Uh, I think a key uh, takeaway for me from that presentation was just the proliferation of, of data that's out there and some, some key critical ones uh, through the work that Lynn's have done for base data, getting that out there, mm -hmm. but also um, likewise getting the localities um, data into ArcGIS Online is, is really a milestone um, moment. So thank you again, Susan, for that. Okay, moving on to our last presenter for the day um, is our international keynote. And for those of you who have been around uh, the geospatial world and the emergency management world for a few years, this is a name that will be very familiar to you. Paul uh, Doherty uh, is a former colleague of, of ours and a, a highly respected um, professional in his domain. He's actually the Director of Innovation at the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation, otherwise known as NAPSIG. Uh, he is a university professor as well. He's a SAR volunteer as well. He's a very busy guy. He's also a good friend. And without that, I'll say kia ora, Paul. Over to you. Kia ora. It's been a while since I've heard that. 
uh, but I do miss that phrase and I miss all of you. Uh, this is Paul Doherty. For those of you that, uh, that don't know me, I worked on the Eagle team a number of years ago and helped uh, push some things along with uh, GIS for emergency management. And so this is just a quick update, a little reflection over the past two years and why I still think that you have the best community out there and that I continue to uh, learn from you all. So I do wanna share a couple of uh, stories, but also give you an update. We're pretty busy over here right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to my screen, but I just wanted to uh, wish you all well and let you know that I still look at you uh, on the map every day and uh, just always wishing you the best. All right. All right, by now, I hope you're just seeing my screen. But I wanted to go back to some of the stuff we talked about uh, before I left, the uh, geospatial concept of operations. I've started to use the term geospatial game plan. And these are just some reflections or iterations on that concept and uh, with some examples. The bad news right now in the United States is uh, we're very busy with disaster management. Uh, we've got a little thing that uh, you might've forgotten about by now, uh, COVID-19. Um, I know that you have a few lingering cases, but obviously um, you've probably seen this map and maps have played a really critical role in COVID-19 response. And the main thing that we've found is that while there've been pandemic exercises in the past, people were generally responding to fake data without thinking about the workflows to get to that data. That's just a quick observation. And I think that's why we're uh, around the world, but especially in the United States, really struggling with this problem. We've also got uh, wildfires out here where I live. I live down here in Redlands, uh, California. Some of you may have been here uh, through different conferences. And uh, due to a series of lightning strikes, really big storms and a couple of human caused fires, we've got fires all over California, but I don't wanna leave out our Arizona and Oregon as well. Um, if you look at the, uh, the Bay Area, north of San Francisco, this entire county, uh, Napa County, probably about a third of it is uh, burning or at risk right now. And then uh, selfishly, uh, this is not a big fire yet, but in Yosemite National Park, uh, just outside of it, there's a fire called the Moccasin Fire or Mock Fire, and we're watching that pretty closely. And a very small version of um, what you've all started, GIS3M, is working together in this region. They're called Yosemite All Hazards uh, Region GIS Group. And they are monitoring uh, radio traffic to try to get a handle on where the fire is. There's so much smoke um, and so much demand for aircraft. They haven't been able to get an adequate map out of the fire agencies. So they're using things like MODIS hotspots and listening to radio traffic and just plotting what they hear. Um, this map that you see here is called Fire Mappers. It's something that we started with the GIS core and we're getting a lot of uh, traffic uh, because what we're doing is as soon as we hear about a fire in our communities, we're putting it on a map and putting a link to where you can get more information. And uh, just to give an idea of the, the demand we're seeing, um, you can see here, probably gonna break 3 million views today or tomorrow. And um, it's just been a really busy time, but I'm so excited that I get to work with volunteers like the GIS Core and Cedar Digital to help get the word out about these fires um, as soon as possible. Um, but it's not all about volunteers and it's uh, certainly not all about the work that I've been doing with the NAPSIG Foundation. Uh, agencies are beginning to really pick up uh, and use GIS, especially for public information maps. And that really, as you all, uh, for those of you that know me, is really near and dear to my heart. And so here's a map of maps that Esri Disaster Response Program is putting together to show all the different uh, approaches to evacuation mapping across uh, California and beyond. So the good news is, while we're still doing a lot of volunteerism and a lot of innovation, a lot of agencies are picking up and actually adopting GIS and most importantly, uh, providing situational awareness for the public. And uh, if fires weren't enough, we also have uh, two uh, tropical systems, we call them hurricanes here, in the, uh, about to enter the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, that's bad news. I've never seen a forecast like this, and I hope that it changes. But uh, by Monday, um, I may be um, heading out that way or at least supporting remotely. So that's why this presentation is going to be a little ad lib, but um, I wanted to fill you in on a little bit on what we're doing. So in particular for search and rescue, we have looked very closely at what New Zealand is doing 
and have adopted the uh, previous GPS workflows that they were using for uh, search and rescue teams. And we've, we've moved to an ArcGIS sort of uh, digital system for doing this. And so here's a sandbox we set up for training. New York Task Force One was just out there this week training in the sandbox. But this is really similar to the deployment environment where all the uh, field apps are ready to go with uh, training videos and ex all this other stuff, uh, training slides, and they can just get in and test out these apps so that they're uh, always able to train even for a small exercise. So that's some of the things we're doing to prepare for hurricanes. And this is the system that they would roll out with uh, next week if they need it. But what I really wanted to talk about today was uh, geospatial game plans. You know, so with all the disasters, the good news is we have a process for building a plan. And I learned a lot of this maybe before I went to New Zealand, but then we actually got to do it in New Zealand because you were small enough, uh, agile enough, open-minded enough, and we're able to really um, think about this in a strategic way. And one of the first things I learned in New Zealand was, you know, the community, building your team. Your team should include first responders, emergency managers, local government staff, especially uh, from what I learned after the Edgecombe flood, how important even non-emergency uh, management staff are to the response. Uh, your local weather office, volunteers have played a critical role, private sector, and GIS specialists, right? That's the team that is gonna be able to build this concept of a geospatial game plan. The second thing is looking at your core information needs, right? So if you have the team, now you're gonna figure out what are the key critical things that they all need to know during a disaster? And it might change based on your audience, but what are the common questions, right? We can anticipate those and we should already have data or workflows to answer those in advance. And that's really a critical part of the game plan. And then you put it all together. And I think it's gonna depend on your hazard. Um, in New Zealand, you know, maybe the way you'd respond to an earthquake is different than a fire, but by building the team for one, you're building the team for both. So I just wanna give you an example of uh, a type of game plan we're looking at that's maybe hazard specific. Here's one for hurricanes or what you would call cyclones. So um, in the United States, we have the National Hurricane Center and they give three to five day weather outlooks. And here's an example from Hurricane Michael, which you may have heard about uh, in 2018. Um, these forecast graphics are great, but they can change very quickly. And so we encourage people to use the, uh, the feed that's coming from the Esri Living Atlas so that you always have an up-to-date graphic, so to speak, in your map and you can begin to anticipate impacts and changes against your own uh, jurisdiction. Next, uh, FEMA has come up with a system called, uh, and FEMA is our version of uh, NEMA, or formerly McDem, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Uh, they look at where is the greatest hazard exposure potentially going to be? And as you know now for tropical systems, it's wind, it's storm surge, which is especially bad in these low-lying areas, and inland flooding. So it's a multifaceted hazard. And the real challenge is uh, identifying not just where is it going to hit, but what are the values at risk? And so they do an analysis where they look at critical infrastructure, vulnerable populations, and they begin to model this in advance of the disaster so that we know where to stage resources. The next part of our game plan, especially if you're local government, you need to be thinking about the public's needs. Um, and thanks, this is uh, Scott Campbell's famous batch. I, just a quick photo from, uh, <laughs> from his place there. Thanks, Scott. But, you know, think about this command center, right, for the public in the living room. They want to know, am I safe where I'm at? They want to know where they can go for safety, and they want to know how they can get there. And that's really important. And we've got some resources here. We've done recent webinars on this topic for public information officers as a focus. Well, if we work backwards from those, the public's needs, then we need to have a plan for what? We need to have a plan for where are evacuations occurring? In the state of Florida, they pre-plan their evacuation zones, much like you do for tsunamis. And then they pick which evacuation zones they're going to trigger. And they make that publicly available year round, just like you're starting to do with your tsunami zones, which is great. We also need to know what's the status of shelters. This has been the biggest challenge in the United States. We have a national shelter system, but they haven't yet done a great job of engaging local governments. Uh, it's been primarily a Red Cross focus. and so. They are now re-looking at that system to advance it, but we've worked closely with digital volunteers to crowdsource the opening and closing of shelters. And here's just a quick 
uh, visualization thanks to the Cedar Digital Core, who we've uh, worked closely with to monitor shelter status. Next, especially for hurricanes, as you've probably seen on TV, the status of evacuation routes is critical. If, uh, even if you provide shelters, or in this, this day and age in COVID-19, uh, hotel vouchers, they need to know if they can get there. And so uh, in the United States, there's various Department of Transportation systems, but a lot of local governments are just using the Ways Connected Citizens program because they want the information in real time and they want to hear from citizens uh, that are using the app. And this can be provided as a feed right inside of your platform. Now, once the public's uh, needs are taken care of, you're more likely to start turning to looking at what they're contributing. And we have found limited success with actually engaging the public to give us information, but they, they volunteer it out on Twitter and Facebook and other places, especially in the United States. And so we've worked closely with the GIS Corps through a project called the Crowdsource Photos. And uh, what they do is they go out onto social media they analyze the photos, find out the location, vet it, and put it on a map. And they do this through a large group of volunteers that have been just amazing. And this is the, probably the first picture we get of what's going on on the ground uh, before even first responders are contributing information. And this has been extremely valuable. And uh, they use this map in state EOCs. They use it in the National uh, Response Coordination Center. And it's, it's, uh, it's a really valuable source of intel. And just as a reminder, that concept was born out of uh, Cyclone uh, Debbie and Cook in New Zealand. Now, of course, uh, things are really rap advancing rapidly with remote sensing, lots of additional satellites, um, lots of extra drone use. And here's an example of using drones that very quickly map the damage. It was actually, I think, a drone operator working for an insurance company who made the data available. And that can be really, really valuable, but still might lag behind. Uh, some of the uh, crowdsource photos and 911 phone calls. And so it's just part of your game plan, but you need to think about remote sensing well in advance of the actual disaster. And that's something we encourage. And then uh, near and dear to my heart and our friends at uh, Fire and Emergency New Zealand is how are we going to geo-enable first responders? And in this case, we use Survey123. We work with FEMA and state teams to give them an app where they can just simply go out and take a photo of what they're seeing. In this case, I'm just showing the damage, but they use this for all of their rescue operations to mark where there's victims that need uh, assistance, but maybe we don't have the resources on the ground. But by extracting the damage assessment information out of this process, it's really valuable to emergency managers who may not be able to get inspectors out there in the field for a number of days, especially when uh, hurricanes leave flooding in their wake. And then we do transition to a formal damage assessment, but it's important that we build upon all this earlier information. FEMA has a process called the preliminary damage assessment process, and they provide a template or form that will help local agencies and state agencies reach uh, a declaration where they can get federal funds. And so by tying the damage assessment process into the economic process, there's a strong focus on readiness and being able to do this quickly and accurately. And I think that uh, first responder data and this field inspector data go hand in hand and, and really thinking about how these fit together in advance is going to help your operation. But we still face great challenges. In the United States, we've got many agencies, which doesn't always work to our advantage. If you're this green stick figure here, I think uh, you could probably relate to this during the Christchurch earthquakes, but first search and rescue knocks on your door to make sure you're okay. They do a quick assessment. Then you've got people looking to uh, fill out forms based on the type of damage to see if your county is gonna be able to get a federal declaration. And then there's a flood insurance program. And then there's disaster survivor assistance teams and Red Cross and state inspectors and insurance adjusters. And even if your house isn't damaged, the trauma from all this interaction alone can be great. And that's why we feel having a game plan can reduce the number of stick figures that have to go out there and knock on, on doors. And this saves time, money, and in a COVID-19 environment, exposure. And so game plans are really, really critical to this, uh, not just during response, but going into recovery. So that's just an example from Hurricane. Uh, this is a little experiment. We're doing uh, these little binders for tornadoes, hurricanes, wildfires. We're working on wildfire right now. Um, 
and we'd like to continue across all hazards, but you'll see the same common pattern every time. Um, I've shared this with some of you through the GIS for EM Slack, but we've just put together a very bare bones PowerPoint template. Uh, if people are intimidated by story maps, you can pull this up and use this to have conversations with your emergency managers that maybe you're having trouble uh, getting through before. So I just wanna come back now um, to center. You know, to me, it's all about the community. Um, it's very difficult in the United States to uh, mirror what you have in New Zealand, right? It's a very, very large country. And I, I think the focus needs to be on regional teams. Um, this is the state of South Carolina, which uh, I forgot how many people are there, but it's probably uh, close to the population of New Zealand. So we're trying to form a state cadre that involves local fire and state search and rescue and state emergency management, bringing the federal government into the mix. And when we do workshops, we really try to focus on the right people that need to work together and making sure that all their core information needs are met. At the bottom of this story map, which I'll share with you, we've got some, uh, some templates and resources, and I'll try to add a few more things in there uh, before you all see this presentation. But um, more important than anything else, I just wanna say thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, for everything you've taught me and continue to teach me. I lurk on the GIS for EM Slack. I'm super proud that you don't need my help anymore. Um, I know that you're getting great support from Eagle uh, and that you're continuing to innovate, right? You're not just doing what you did yesterday. You're always advancing and, and pushing the envelope. And I really am encouraged and uh, look forward to seeing you all again soon. So apologize for the rapid fire presentation, but uh, I've got to get back to work. So uh, hopefully when this is all over, I can maybe take a vacation down there or see you in 2021 at the New Zealand Ezra User Conference. Thank you. It's, it's always good to, to catch up and, and see what you're up to. Um, it's quite amazing actually to see what's happening um, between New Zealand and America and, and where, the, where the future lies. I, I think that, that concept of regional teams that Paul was referring to, we're, we're already seeing it in, in many of these other presentations, that theme of um, local glass, grassroots collaboration um, actually ending up to, to be the capability in the end that, that supplies what we need. So. Paul, we're going to grab you before you go back to work and um, hopefully in the Q&A you can answer one or two of the questions that we have um, flooding in for you. But before we do that, I just wanted to, yeah, I guess sum up. So it's a lot of content to get through in a short mm -hmm. amount of time and um, some really good presentations and, and being able to almost peek inside other organisations and, and how they're bringing GIS more into emergency management. So, Brian, did you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think one of the key things for me, I absolutely agree with your sentiments there. One of the key things I think is just going back to Teresa's presentation, it's just getting on and delivering, getting out there and doing it, delivering that capability is, is really important. I think I think the, the, the collaboration aspect is a common thing every year we talk about it, the, the level of collaboration and engagement between organisations has to be there, it has to be as a key criteria for success. And then to Susan's presentation as well around the, the fundamental data, I think that work has to continue mm. and has to grow further. So um, yeah, no, um, thank you to all our presenters. Um, we are gonna open up now to uh, the question and answer panel. Mm. What could possibly go wrong here, everyone? <laughs> um, so uh, let's just kick this off um, if we can. So I have a present uh, a question for Teresa Simcox. And the question is, what was the hardest part of getting your councils and other agencies to collaborate? Well, what was the hardest challenge that you had there? I think for us, it was being able to get staff time made available. Um, part of that was committing some funding from our own budgets to get them in the room and around the table but quite often because agencies are so busy and work programs are so tight it does become a little bit of a restriction around how much time you can have off them and the best way that we could deal with that was to try and block all of our training into small windows of really intensive stuff um, and workshops that would take sort of an entire afternoon and we would get committed time for that. Um, because generally speaking, the space between 
um, those workshops, not a lot would get done. So it is mo mainly around time resource. Cheers. Fantastic. Thank you, Teresa. Paul, did you have a question for Susan there? Yeah, so Susan, we, we had a question that came in very quickly um, after your presentation. And that question was, what new data sets are LIMS looking to enable for the emergency management sector? Can you share any details? Well, now, uh, I come hot off the press from a meeting with the senior managers at Land Information New Zealand this morning. Um, not so much new data sets, but just trying to improve the data sets that we have got. So um, I guess the big, maybe not in the next year, but the big three things that we're working towards is um, obviously with the LIDAR, and doing the data collection with the LIDAR and then creating the products that you need. So the storage of that LIDAR um, in a coordinated way, because it's a big data set, right? Um, and creating some national DEMs and DTMs if we're able to update those two uh, longer term after all the data is collected. Um, also the Nirvana of being able to associate a building with an address with a property, because I, know just how much that means, especially in emergency management, if we could avoid some of the data cleaning that we have to do during a response in particular, that that's, would just be fantastic. I'd love to be able to contribute to that. So that's what we're working towards. And then um, particularly with um, the agencies that we're collaborating with, um, working with NZTA to try and um, find a way to open up the roads data set and bring together information about state highways along with the local roads. They're, they're the real big three nuggety things. Oh, and I suppose um, using the LIDAR to um, improve the National River Network too. That would be also it. So that, not sure it's new data sets, but a lot of work to be done on the current ones, that's for sure. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's a long way since um, Paul was last year. And, yeah, Paul's got a bit of a fan club, actually. I'm looking on Twitter, so I'll give it over to Graham now to ask a, a question that's come through to Paul. Just for Paul, very quickly, um, people are quite interested, and in, you mentioned at the end of your presentation that you're, you're working on a couple of responses. Are you able to share a little bit more with the group as to what, what you've been doing in the past sort of day or two? Um, we were, we're seeing the news headlines here with some of the, the wildfires and also uh, Hurricane Laura, I believe it was. Um, are you able to share some, some more with us? Sure. Um, well, for one thing, the hurricane response is ongoing. They are trying to transition to recovery. The search and rescue teams that we support uh, have collected about 50,000 surveys uh, on the ground. Most of those are structural assessments. Um, fortunately, it was a good evacuation, so there is not a lot of rescues, but a lot of human assistance, things that help to uh, to record on a map and take a photo, like something as simple as rescuing someone's pets or dropping off some meals. And uh, a really massive effort between federal, state, and local agencies, uh, probably the biggest deployment we've seen, and had lots of help from Esri Disaster Response over the weekend. And um, can't say enough about how great uh, all the search and rescue capabilities are coming together. As for wildfires, um, it was sort of a freak event I mean, I'm sure it's happened in past history, but not while so many people live in the wildland urban interface, but many, many lightning strikes. And so, uh, you know, we were relying on uh, information that we haven't used that much before in California. Like we have a lightning strike uh, feed, which was really, really useful. And um, again, damage assessment plays a critical role in getting people back into their homes. And that's kind of the phase for most of the fires that we're in now. There's, there's still a few active ones, but, uh, very um, wild couple of weeks, and I look forward to wrapping up and getting ready for the next disaster. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Paul. That's awesome. Um, I do have one or two other questions that are on the feed here that are just popping up that, that maybe aren't specifically related to the EM stream, but, but actually have relevance here. So I'll, I'll just answer some of them here. Um, I've had a question, uh, any chance we can get a copy of the Eric's presentation this morning? from the plenary uh, on how all of government is managing the COVID crisis. Uh, there were some great examples in there that they'd love to share. Um, if you do or would like that presentation, if you just contact your account manager 
and we'll have a conversation with police around uh, their ability to share that and uh, we'll, we'll connect the dots there for you so just just contact your eagle account manager or a uh, uh, any Eagle staff member actually will be able to help you there. Okay. Um, there was one other question here, uh, which I think was for Jeff Monder, but I think we've lost him off the call. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to hold that one back and let Jeff answer that one separately. It was around um, all of government um, initiatives that Jeff was talking about. So uh, with that, I think we will look to close the session. Thank you very much to the panelists and presenters who, who've taken time out, including Paul, who's uh, probably quite late at night there now. Thank you for that, Paul. Uh, Susan, Teresa, and Jeff as well, thank you very much. So the presentations will all be available from today on the platform for all the attendees to view for a two week period. And you can actually keep on asking questions during the two week period, and we'll make sure that those questions get fully answered for you. Um, and everyone will be circulated, uh, the answers will be circulated to everyone. Um, yeah, with that, we'll bring the stream to a close. And I genuinely hope that next year when we have this stream, it will be face to face and we can have a bit of a bit of a conversation afterwards and, and maybe a beverage or two. But um, this is the new world we're in. So thank you all. Take care. And um, yeah, we'll speak to you all soon. Take care.